While Ontario's reopening plan seems promising, we can't help but notice that Premier Ford is treading rather slowly compared to other provinces such as Alberta, BC and Quebec that have too experienced high numbers of cases during the third wave, but are going into June with lesser restrictions. Whether this approach is right or wrong, let's speak to NDP MPP Jill Andrew, who represents the riding of Toronto St. Paul's. Thank you for joining us, MPP. The NDP has been pushing for outdoor amenities to reopen in the province since the beginning of this month, citing people's physical and mental health as a main reason. This week, people are finally able to play sports on various courts. Do you think this move came in a timely manner or is this our province moving too slowly? Thank you for the question, Julia. You know, um, I, I believe that the province has had a hard time following the directives, the recommendations um, of the Ontario Science Table of Public Health, um, of the experts of ICU doctors. Uh, we have known for quite a while you know, that, for instance, the playgrounds, you know, uh, was not the culprit uh, for COVID-19 spread. Uh, we know, and the experts have told this to the Ford government, uh, whether it was workplaces, factories, you know, uh, congregate settings where people couldn't socially distance, uh, long-term care homes where, you know, uh, frontline healthcare heroes were underworked, understaffed, under-resourced, underpaid, didn't have access to proper PPE uh, throughout various times of the pandemic. Uh, these are the kinds of things that the Ford government should have acted swiftly on so that quite frankly, uh, we could have been enjoying, um, you know, Ontario's amenities, outdoor amenities much sooner. And I have to say this, I mean, obviously the NDP, we championed uh, to have Ontario outdoors uh, or to have outdoor amenities reopened. You know, the Ford government denied uh, the very motion that we put forth demanding, um, you know, the outdoor amenities. And of course, a few days later, you know, decided to do it themselves. I, I think a lot of time could be saved uh, if the Ford government didn't play politics, quite frankly. Um, a lot of lives could be saved uh, if the government hadn't played politics and simply stuck to what needed to be done. Uh, whether that was supporting workers, supporting small businesses, uh, supporting renters, uh, ensuring that our long-term care homes, you know, were being inspected, were, were properly taken care of, uh, ensuring our schools were safe. I could continue going on on all the things that Ford uh, and the Ford government, frankly, has done wrong, uh, which has led us to a much uh, longer and, and numerous lockdowns and uh, mental health, you know, disrepair, lives, you know, lost, et cetera, et cetera. As of today, over 8.5 million vaccine dosages have been administered in the province and over 590,000 people have been fully vaccinated. Are you finding this pace satisfactory? Thank you so much for the question, Julia. Um, you know, there are almost 15 million Ontarians. <laughs> so uh, we certainly have, you know, many folks who require their vaccines. I know here in St. Paul's, uh, it was a Herculean act to find, to get information on, on vaccines and where you could access a clinic, for instance. You know, uh, many of our community members and Ontarians, you know, had to, you know, resort to, to vax hunters uh, to find out where to get their vaccines. And uh, this is just not appropriate. You know, the provincial government, the Ford government, uh, should have had a transparent, comprehensive vaccine rollout uh, that centered equity, that ensured frontline healthcare workers, essential workers, uh, those uh, with, with vulnerable health conditions, and of course, uh, those who are in uh, particular areas uh, where there was confirmed uh, high community spread. Uh, these people should have been prioritized. You know, instead what we saw was a bit of a piecemeal vaccine rollout where in fact, it was proven that some of the government members' uh, ridings, which didn't even have high COVID-19 rates, you know, were, were deemed hotspots. So there's so much uh, more that should be done. Uh, there are many folks now who are really anxious about getting their second uh, COVID-19 vaccine. We have many who are still 
uh, you know, uh, registering for their first vaccine. So, no, I don't think the vaccine rollout has been uh, commendable. It certainly hasn't been, uh, you know, it certainly hasn't been a, how do I say it, you know, a, a, a positive experience for most folks, because not everyone has a chance, quite frankly, to refresh their computer and refresh their social media accounts uh, to learn where they may happen to get a vaccine. Uh, many folks are at work, quite frankly, Julia, you know, or they're traveling to work on our sometimes crowded public, public transit uh, because, of course, uh, lack of provincial funding to public transit. Uh, so there are so many systemic pieces that have, quite frankly, led to, to a, a rollout that was not equitable and certainly didn't, uh, you know, prioritize or, or consider those who are most vulnerable in our communities. Today, Premier Doug Ford wrote to medical experts and stakeholders asking for their thoughts on the reopening of schools as early as next month. Ontario's Science Advisory Table has suggested that the reopening of schools would result in a manageable increase in cases. Earlier in the spring, Education Minister Stephen Lecce said that schools were safe. However, Premier Ford contends schools are a source of more outbreaks than any other location. He also points out that 41% of Ontario education workers have received the COVID-19 vaccine. Why is there so much discrepancy and are we doing enough to ensure that students return to classrooms in a timely manner? Thank you so much again for that question, Julia. You know, I'm going to go back to the Ontario Science Table. You know, I'm going to go back to the public health experts. You know, um, we have been calling, you know, as official opposition for a very long time for this government to listen, frankly, to their own advisors, to the experts, and to have that, have science guide their decisions. Um, and, you know, of course, as you know, uh, that just sim simply has not been happening, you know, at a fast enough or or consistent enough rate. Uh, we have demanded smaller classroom sizes. Uh, we have demanded asymptomatic testing. Uh, we have demanded proper ventilation for students and staff and education workers and teachers to keep everyone safe. Uh, we simply cannot have uh, you know, students go back to classrooms that are not safe. We want schools to reopen, but Doug Ford, and Minister Stephen Lecce need to make sure that our classrooms are safe. And uh, we, the NDP, have certainly told them how to do that. And that has been informed by science, that has been informed by our teachers' unions, uh, by our education workers. My apologies, that was a phone ringing. And uh, at the end of the day, safety is key. You know, what we do not want is for the Ford government to use COVID um, as a guise, quite frankly, to, to you know, to, to disseminate their, their digitization plan, you know, to take school online permanently, you know, a plan that we know is not going to bode well uh, for kids or parents or caregivers or educators or education workers' mental health. Toronto's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Aline Devella, who had originally ordered all schools to transition to remote learning in April, recently said that she is in favour of schools reopening given that they operate safely. What do safe circumstances look like, according to you? Thank you again, Julia, for that question. Uh, I guess to reiterate some of the points I made last time, uh, you know, schools need to have capped class sizes. You know, we need smaller classrooms. Uh, and I should, I should specify, we need less students uh, in our classrooms. It's just not possible to have classrooms of 30 plus kids, 20 plus kids, you know, 15 plus kids socially distanced. It's not possible. Uh, we need more investment in education, not less. Uh, we need to ensure that we have more teachers, more education workers to support the diverse ranges of uh, the diverse range of needs uh, that our students present with. Uh, we need asymptomatic testing. You know, uh, we need to ensure that that school communities are supported in order for them to function uh, properly. 
And quite frankly, long before COVID, it was no secret that we've got, I don't know, a 14, 15, 16 billion dollar uh, school disrepair um, across Ontario. You know, schools are literally crumbling. And this is simply not a safe or healthy environment for any kids, uh, any students, any teachers, education workers, custodians, uh, staff, admin, nobody in the building is safe. If the buildings are literally crumbling, uh, if the AC is not working, if the heat's not working, you know, um, if, if there's, there's you know, uh, water issues with contamination, these are issues that we have to tend to. And the government has long known about this, and they have sat on billions and billions of dollars uh, throughout this pandemic. Again, um, not supporting, not supporting the folks who've needed it the most. Uh, you know, our education system, um, our healthcare sector, frontline healthcare workers, teachers, education workers, our kids, you know, families who have needed support. You know, we've seen an increase, for instance, in people visiting food banks uh, during the pandemic. But yet the government has not, you know, made any progress with regards to, you know, creating a food and water strategy, for instance. Uh, the government has not made any progress uh, with regards to, you know, naming the homelessness crisis that has continued to soar during COVID-19. So there are many pieces of the puzzle that need to be worked on. And, and it, it's a systems approach. You know, our schools are part of our larger social system. They're part of our communities. Uh, so all pieces have to be in place in order for our schools to be able to open safely. Uh, we certainly want kids back in classrooms. Uh, we know that the experts say that kids function best uh, when they're in in-person learning, uh, where they can see and, and connect with their teachers, their education workers, their peers, their friend group, for goodness sakes. But it has to be done safely. Premier Ford has been writing to the federal government asking for stricter border measures and better screening for travelers coming into Ontario. The Progressive Conservative Party also is purchasing ads on social media, TV, radio and billboards to criticize Prime Minister Trudeau's border policies. Do you think the lack of border restrictions has been the only contributing factor to a high number of cases in this province? Thank you again, Julia, for that question. Um, I will speak explicitly to paid sick days. At the end of the day, when a worker wakes up sick, and they have to make the decision between going to work, could be a cold, it could be a regular flu, or it could be COVID. They have to make that decision between going to work and paying rent and having food on the table. That is a tight spot that the Ford government should have never placed any Ontarian in. Uh, we still do not have a comprehensive paid sick day program here in Ontario. We know that the federal program it's got holes, it's got gaps, it's not comprehensive, it's not necessarily employee friendly, it's not immediate. You know, you lose near half your income with the federal program and the provincial, you know, three measly days when you're supposed to isolate for 14 days makes absolutely no sense. Uh, if the provincial government, if Ford, if Doug Ford, who by the way, as you know, Julia, sat at home pretty comfortably isolating himself to the tune of 800 plus dollars a day paid, right? If it's good enough for Doug Ford, it should have been good enough for all Ontarians and three days simply doesn't cut it. Lastly, many Ontarians are not waiting for the economy to fully reopen. What would you recommend that the Ford government does to ensure that as many restrictions on businesses are lifted for a safe return soon? Thank you very much for that question, Julia. You know, again, I trust science. That's, that's where I always go back to. You know, what is public health telling us about uh, small business reopening? Uh, what is the Ontario science table telling us about, you know, public restrictions? You know, if businesses are able to open, uh, we need to get them open as soon as possible. But if they're not, or even as they open and require additional support, the government needs to ensure that they step up. The Ontario Small Business uh, Support Grant or program, you know, has been insufficient. 
Uh, there are too many, too many folks here where I am in St. Paul's and certainly across the province who have not been able to, to, to access the Ontario uh, Small Business Support Program. Uh, they've been illegible, you know, they've been ineligible because they are new businesses, you know, uh, they've been told that they're getting funding. Uh, but it hasn't arrived yet. It didn't arrive in 10 business days, and it, it's now two weeks and it still hasn't arrived. Uh, this is just unconscionable uh, when small businesses have staff to pay for, overhead, uh, you know, equipment, products for sale, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you just can't do that. So for small businesses to survive, they need to be opened uh, with supports. It needs to be, of course, safety first, but the government cannot turn their backs on them. Uh, last year, we proposed the Save Main Street plan. This would have given you know, small businesses during uh, the heights of the pandemic uh, rent relief supports uh, to help them cover uh, you know, their, their expenses, uh, utility freeze, a ban on evictions, all kinds of things that would have been directly supportive to our small businesses and also our, our residential tenants too as well. And these were shut down by the province. So our small businesses need support. Um, I'd also like to mention, you know, along with the reopening plan, uh, we have a very, you know, vital cultural and arts sector here in Ontario. And many folks in the live arts uh, sector, whether we're talking theater, dance, opera, uh, comedy, musicians, performing arts, you know, they want to know too, uh, what's their reopening plan? You know, we know that the government has certainly allowed for certain of our sector friends, like in film and television, uh, to open safely and to be able to continue uh, working on productions. So, you know, live arts uh, performers, all of our sectors need to be able to engage uh, with the Ford government and particularly with Minister Lisa McLeod, the, the Heritage and Culture and Sports and Tourism Minister, uh, to ensure that, that they're at the table too that there's a reopening plan, you know, that it's an equitable plan uh, where all parties are able to voice their opinions, be heard and be considered. Uh, because currently now in the culture sector, uh, we have some who are at the table, quote unquote, and some who have simply not been invited. And that is not equitable. It is unfair. It's frankly discriminatory. And we have to do better. So we need a reopening plan that is uh, comprehensive, that is transparent, that is, you know, situated with health and safety first, uh, but certainly one that's equitable and recognizes the continued economic downfall uh, when certain sectors are not able to explore their reopening options. Do you have any plan for these uh, specific se sectors such as live performance, like you're mentioning as an example, who are not able to open or to really conduct business? Do you have a plan for that or do you have any suggestions? I certainly do. You know, at the end of the day, uh, in order for us to have a plan to allow for our culture sector uh, to robustly reopen, we need to have head notice. There needs to be a runway. You know, you can't simply just say, OK, time to open and have folks be ready in live arts. So people need to be communicated with, uh, you know, transparently. They need to know exactly uh, what the plan is and when. Uh, it needs to be regulatory fairness, quite frankly. Uh, you cannot say, for instance, that live streaming, you know, which is completely a safe practice, you know, is not allowed, but yet, you know, BMX bike, you know, uh, racing or whatnot um, is allowed, or, you know, our parks and playgrounds are open. And of course, we're happy that those outdoor amenities are, are reopened, but why not live streaming? when we know that that has been one of the only ways, for instance, in the live arts, that artists have been able to, to maintain some income. And let's not forget that that sector, you know, many of the artists, you know, have already been precariously employed even before COVID. So that's one, you know, very strong thing is that we need to have regulatory fairness. Uh, we need to, to have a government that listens to all of the art sector and not only a select couple. Thank you for sharing your perspective with us, MPP Andrew. It was great having you. Thank you very much. There will be more on Take TV's International News Channel. I'm Julia Cosby. Keep watching.